Okay, so looks like uh, everything is uh, ready now. So uh, good afternoon to, um, to everyone. Welcome to the Trade Unionist Assembly uh, taking place within the European uh, Forum 2020. Um, this time uh, will be uh, the theme that we will be working around with uh, three very interesting uh, panelists is the Corona crisis and its effects on the trade unions. Um, so welcome to all of uh, you uh, engaging today in, in, in this forum. Um, quickly, I will go to, um, before starting with the housekeeping remarks, I will tell you my name is Enrique, Enrique Carmona. Uh, I um, work for the Spanish Trade Union Confederation, Comisiones Obreras. I'm head of the Brussels office and uh, I'm uh, currently in Brussels in the office. Um, now, as a general um, uh, uh, frame, I will say that the, the aim of uh, this meeting is to keep uh, uh, building uh, um, collaborative uh, space uh, between trade unions and, uh, poli and political organizations. I think that we have been doing quite well in the, in the last uh, four uh, times that, the, or in the last three times that this forum has met. And uh, the uh, topic of today is, uh, I think is going to pave the way to very interesting conclusions. Um, before giving the floor to our uh, first panelists, some uh, housekeeping remarks as usual. Well, the first and the most important probably is about the interpretation. Fortunately, today we have uh, six uh, um, languages offered on interpretation, which are French, English, Spanish, Greek, Russian, and Italian. Uh, then uh, there are several ways to get to the interpretation. You can, depending on the type of device you're working with, you will have either, usually on the uh, down, right side of your screen, uh, you can have either three little spots or uh, a plus three little spots, or you can have a globe uh, signaling the, the interpretation. So just click there, go to interpretation. I will do the same with you at the same time. So you can see interpretation, language interpretation. Once you click on the interpretation, you can uh, choose one of the uh, six languages in offer. And once you have chosen your language, uh, two uh, remarks, keep your interpretation all the time in the same language. And if you take the floor, please use the language that you are listening to. And second, uh, there is also one more um, facility, which is, uh, silence the original audio. In such a fashion, you will avoid listening to the interpreter and also to the uh, uh, person who is uh, having the floor at that given moment. Okay, so um, this is regarding the interpretation and a request for the interp from the interpreters, please speak slowly at a natural pace and it will be easier for everyone uh, to follow uh, and understand uh, the aim of uh, your question or uh, your statement. Uh, I will give the floor to uh, each of the participants. Uh, uh, they will um, be able to make a presentation for around 10 or 10 to 12 minutes, no more. Then after that, I will, I will make a question to, to the panelists, same question or set of questions for all the three, and then you can write the questions you want to, uh, to make to, the, to each panelist. To do so, you have uh, an, an option, which is, uh, let me go to the option, questions and answers. Don't use the chat. The chat is only for technical problems. If you have a technical problem, make, uh, state your problem with the chat and someone from the IT uh, department will help you to solve, uh, solving it. If you want to make a question to uh, one of the panelists, you can write your question even while the panelist is uh, um, taking the floor, is having the floor. You can write your question and then from there will be someone else uh, controlling all these questions and 
uh, he will decide either to place the question on your behalf or give you the floor to make the question yourselves. This is important that you remember to use the question and answers uh, facility. And I think that regarding question nine, make the question, I think that's, uh, that makes all about the uh, housekeeping remarks. So we are going to start now with our first um, panelist. Uh, today is uh, Jota Lazaropoulou. Uh, she is president of the National Bank Employees Trade Union in Greece, uh, former Ethnodata. Uh, Yota, she fought uh, the subcontracting practices of the National Bank uh, a few years ago and won. They won this fight. Uh, congratulations for that. So they got the real contracts uh, in, in that time. She's a physicist um, on musculoskeletal diseases and is also a software engineer uh, for the National Bank. So, Yota, you have the floor now for your presentation. You have 10, Ευχαριστώ και εγώ πάρα πολύ, Ενρίκε, για την ευκαιρία που μου δίνετε να συμμετέχω στο φόρουμ και να μιλήσω σε αυτό, όπως επίσης και για την ευκαιρία right. να... Right. Well, thank you very much. I'm so pleased to be taking the floor today to have the possibility to speak my own language, to speak Greek to you today. It's so much easier for me, I have to say. Thank you for that. So I try to communicate in a more simpler uh, fashion. So I will share with, the, with you a few slides. I hope I managed to share my screen actually. Hope this works. Well, let's try. Well, I'll try to explain the situation that we're experiencing in Greece today. And uh, to explain the situation in a specific country, you actually need to be able to understand it before you describe it. So bear with me, I'm looking uh, for my file that I will be sharing with you. There you go. So you have my shared screen on your own screens now. Like I said, I would like to provide a short description of the situation in Greece. So to speak about the current situation, we need to speak about the pandemic and the evolution of the pandemic in Greece. As you can see on the screen, you have two graphs. Well, at the beginning of the summer, the Greek government decided to open up the borders without imposing uh, tests, PCR tests, uh, including from people uh, landing from a plane or a boat. The government was under pressure from the business sector to try to recover and make up for the losses at the beginning of the season, the tourist season. So, well, today, this is week three of a full lockdown. Again, this is the full a second lockdown. First one started in March, of course, and in the meantime, be between the two lockdowns, there were more restrictions, of course. So we had to close down companies after the decision of blocking down the country. This caused economic issues, as you may imagine. And the consequences was that it reduced the wages of workers. This is what is shown by the Labour Institute. So there you have the percentage of employees with a salary of up to 200 euros. So for the second quarter of 2019, you had a 1% uh, margin. And for the same period in 2020, 12%. You, see the, you can see the comparing between two years, 19 and 20. And the percentage of workers with less than 1,000 euros is up to 72%. So 72% of employees have wages uh, that, si that type, that size. So uh, the government tried to uh, face that situation. They suspended contracts, working contracts. So the companies closed down because of the government or if they just closed down for other purposes, people would not work. And so they would have a compensation of 534 euros a month. This corresponds to the uh, poverty threshold, even for Greece, that's very low. Then there was a program called cooperation. 
So there was a 20% time reduction, working time reduction decided by the companies. They will get support, financial support from the state, but they actually lose 20% of their wages. So there's a contradiction here. On the one hand, we complain that there were not enough restrictions in the sector of tourism and transport. But on the other, we're complaining because the workers' wages go down. So I'd like to be clear on this matter. So this would actually confirm what seems obvious that trade unionists only criticize things and people. But I think there's a contradiction there. And this contradiction comes from the following um, reason. Greece is the one before last country in the list of EU member states when it comes to extraordinary expenses to face the pandemic. So the government used 37 billion euros. This is uh, something that they used and they inherited from the left government. So among the 37, 20 were available for to fight the crisis. Now, unfortunately, we had the wrong government policy from scratch. In the first quarter of 2019, growth was already going down. Then there were more contradictions. We're closing down restaurants and bars. We canceled all major events. But at the same time, you could take the bus or get the subway, and it was packed with people. So, as stated by the Confederation of Public Transport, there was also a possibility to add 500 buses for the Athens greater area with a very limited cost, and they didn't do it. So, it is another contradiction because we are blaming people for not wearing a mask, we're all, or not wearing their mask properly, and, and we're uh, blaming the government for not using the necessary money to help healthcare. So what about the trade union's activities, which try to remain active in spite of limitations and prohibitions to, to, to do things? So there, there was a first May celebration. We had people from the cultural sector who've been strongly impacted we had hot people from the hospital sector, restaurants, but people met on a per sector basis. So there was no real coordination between the different sectors, be it for the public sector or the private sector. So they couldn't find a coordinated answer to that. And next Thursday, there'll be a strike it's a reaction to a situation coordinated by the Action Center in Athens and then they try to coordinate the different sectors. So initiatives also can be taken within the companies to make sure that uh, protection measures are taken and respected. You know, distribution of face masks, also uh, respect of these uh, distancing measures and so on and so on. Now, in the meantime, the government voted a law that actually weakened the labor, the, the labor inspectorate. And this caused many problems. So he had to face the consequences of the pandemic. And the consequences are not suffered similarly by all classes. So even when you work remotely, you don't face the crisis similarly. At the beginning of the pandemic, you know, directors, management or executives took their laptops and worked from home. And they stayed safe at home and would give orders for others to move around. And what happened is that the most vulnerable workers had no choice. They had to take public transport, buses and subway, as on the picture you could see before. It was the only way for them to move around. So it was not an easy solution. These people ended up being exposed and would pay the price for that. They would get ill. Now, the government knew there would be reactions in spite of the restrictions, you know, they knew it. Since the summer, they've tried to pass laws to reduce demonstration rights. Yet law 4703, uh, 
which looks like a decree adopted by the Greek junta in 1973, actually. So if the government wanted to scare people, scare them off and not demonstrate, well, first it didn't work because people still met. There was a huge march, a huge demonstration with dozens of thousands of people on October the 10th. It was just outside the Athens courts and there the far right wing party, uh, uh, the Golden Dawn was sentenced. It was a big victory against fascism. Then on the 17th of November, we celebrated the students' revolution against the junta with the Polytechnical School. It's a big tradition. It's a big march with thousands of protesters. And this year, they forget, they for, forbade um, groups of more than four people on the entire territory. This prohibition was seen and deemed as anti-constitutional. It was not respected. And so people met and the police reacted and um, carried out repression. Uh, it was a violent repression. Yesterday, the prosecutor's office started a preliminary investigation against uh, Tsitpras, former prime minister, a leader in the uh, communist party, and to see to which extent he violated uh, the uh, law on the pandemic. They claim that they've incited the people to disobey the law. So you will judge, but at least we should maybe uh, write a text uh, to denounce police violence in Greece. It's symbolic, but it would be nice to for us to do something to send a clear message from abroad. Like I said, the more things to come, 26 November, that's on Thursday. So this is a gathering organized by the Labor Center of Athens. The purpose is to coordinate all economic sectors. That's the call to strike and to face restriction measures. And actually many workers are currently unemployed. Um, they've been fired or they're just uh, waiting for their work to come back. So it would be hard to organize and people, a lot of people work remotely. So it's, it's our goal to better coordinate this event with people. We'll also organize a march and a parade with motorbikes. So we hope that this strike makes a lot of noise so that they hear that we're against their bills, the bills proposed by the government. There's just one positive thing in this. That's um, a parenthood holiday, um, which has been increased. Otherwise, when it comes to the rest, they're attacking the trade unions. For example, they don't allow us to occupy spaces. They don't allow us to do some picketing anymore. So I think this strike can be efficient. So this is this Thursday. And we would like to postpone uh, the vote on the bill. Uh, as such, it would be already, already a first battle won in this war. And we see that uh, uh, foreclosure has stopped now until the end of the year. The government and the banks would like to start uh, foreclosing again but uh, it, it stopped now. now. Things are complex even for the unions because the percentage of unionized workers is weak. 77% of, of employees claim that they're not a member of a trade union. So many young people, many vulnerable workers. And these are people working next door most of the time, you know, people close to us. People coming in, uh, in, in to work, but not legally working for the same company. They work for a subcontractor, for example. So it's a big gap for us. It's a big issue for us. It could have consequences, you know. Let's imagine 
you take Larco, it's a big company in Greece. You have a thousand people working there uh, permanently on a permanent contract, 1,000 people, but 4,000 people work there on an outsource contract. So sub from a subsidiary or uh, 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 an outsource company. So we need to provide more information. We need to inform our members. We need to communicate across Greece. Information, uh, the, the media rather, is not objective in Greece. Mass media is not objective. So we need to use all the means available to communicate. And we need to use social media to communicate and reach our, the people. Moreover, the unions have to show the contradictions in the system. This system is not able to efficiently face the pandemic. And so they try to keep their business as usual. But not, nothing new under the sky there. There was a pandemic in Europe a hundred years ago already. And for science, you know, a century is not that much time. So we cannot forget uh, such, a, such a huge pandemic as a hundred years ago. There were more epidemics, uh, smaller ones, but in different places around the globe. And in spite of that, the system decided to not invest into vaccine and healthcare or prevention. So the system prefers to keep business as usual and ignore that. Today, the Pisarivi Commission published a report. Mr. Pisarivi had the Economy Nobel Prize. And so we asked him to write a report on the growth prospects and sustainable growth in Greece. This is a, a, a document, 250 pages. It's written in Greek. And I think we have a very clear title there for this report. And the title Yota, reads... Two more minutes, Jota, please. Pisa Rivis, so that's The Economist. Pisa Rivis wants to reduce the cost of labor. So it means that somehow people should make less money. Now, we're facing a crisis and it's easier for us to reach from our colleagues and co-workers and show that getting organized and getting coordinated is the only way out. We saw that in 2009 in Greece with the first crisis and we see it now again. So we'd like to thank you. Thank you all for your attention. Should you have any questions, please shoot. I'm there to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yota. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, for following my suggestion of the two minutes, it took you only one minute and a half uh, to, uh, to end your presentation. Quite interesting with uh, a lot of um, uh, very um, interesting facts uh, that uh, and food for thought uh, about what is going on, not only in Greece, but all around Europe. Now, um, before uh, Daniele um, makes uh, questions raised by other participants uh, or give the floor to other participants. I have two questions for you as I will for the other two panelists. What are your conclusions? What experience is uh, the one that you learn from uh, this crisis from your position? You are now a trade unionist uh, official. Um, and what, is the, uh, what have you learned uh, from this crisis? And then which kind of changes uh, shall you propose to be introduced in order to face uh, in a better shape uh, another crisis of this like? All right. All right. Now, how can I say? Well, I tried to do that in the findings of the conclusions of my speech, but 
to put it in this way. We need to focus on unions, unions and unions and coordination, coordination, coordination. This is the two key words, unions and coordination. And we, the trade unionists, have under, underestimated the need for coordination. We have behaved like amateurs, you know, not like pros. We have to understand that our opponent is well organized. They have a staff like the army. They have groups of lawyers and law firms and so on. We don't seem to have that. And workers tend to think that their employer is just a collaborator. I don't want to cause issues between in or within companies, but we need to look people in the eyes and especially the management. And we see that in Greece. When there is no money for hospitals, we see what happens. I didn't give you figures about the hospitals in Greece, but there is money. There is money. The government has money. So let's use it. And so I think that we need to act at two levels. First, we need to promote our ideology we need to show who the opponent is, how the opponent acts. And secondly, we have to get better organized. We'll have to get ready, ready for the fight and win. There's no other way to go. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Jota, Daniele, do we have questions uh, from the floor? Not now, not yet. I don't see any open question in the Q&A nor in the chat or anything. I remind everyone, if you want to write them in your languages, use the Q&A button that you can see at the bottom of your screen. If not questions from the floor, I, Jota, there are still a few issues that I have, uh, I have taken note about. And uh, one is, um, uh, um, regarding your demonstrations in the streets and um, the lack of support from the big mass media. Uh, this is not new, it's happening all around, but is it so bad? Is it that bad in Greece? Well, well, the media, mass media. Well, what can I say? Well, actually, in Greece, we're currently living through weird times. You know, information is bias. The information we hear is not correct. I, I, I sometimes have the feeling that I, I live in a different country from what I read about. And in uh, 2009, well, there was a big demonstration, people protested and so on and so on. And so the bigger the lie, the better. The people, the bigger the lie, the, people, the more or the easier for it to accept. You know, Goebbels, the Nazi minister from propaganda, for propaganda would have been so proud of what's done in Greece today when it comes to propaganda. And so when it comes to these large demonstrations, well, there are some reactions. People don't uh, just uh, cry on their fate, you know? If, if you have workers in the field of culture, they haven't made money for months now, and they have so many credits pay back and they try to show solidarity and and stick together and so they share songs and music and by that by doing that they demonstrate and share and show their anger and do not respect prohibition to walk the streets now as i tried to explain in my presentation it, it's all about coordination it's all about being more centralized to coordinate the movement. So we need to make sure that we keep our momentum. We need to better coordinate because then we'll be more efficient. Thank you.
Thank you, Jota. Uh, Daniele, do we have questions from the floor, from the audience? Still nothing. If not, I still have questions for, for Jota, eh? because uh, there was something also interesting. Uh, Jota, uh, regarding, you said something about um, uh, the suspension of contracts. I mean, I suppose that we are talking about furlough workers uh, at the minimum of 534 euros per month. Is this amount paid by the government, by the um, enterprise, by the social security system or the un unemployment benefits? Who is paying for that 534 uh, euros per month? Uh όχι, δεν κατάλαβα αυτό που είπες. Δεν είναι για τους χαμηλόμιστους, είναι για όλους. Μπορεί να ο μισθός σου να ήταν χίλια... Okay, actually... Uh, okay, I'll try and explain. If you have a wage and your company closes, let's say you have a wage, 1,500, 2,000 euros, your company is closed off. Let's say you work for a restaurant. That restaurant is closed because the government uh, has asked you to close, or your company just is in trouble and goes uh, into um, bankruptcy, for example, you will earn and receive that amount, 534 euros to be precise. That money comes directly from the state. And, well, you're expected to survive with that tiny amount, of course. And uh, as I said, uh, it can get even worse. You can have a company that, uh, for example, decides that half of its workforce will be officially in short-term unemployment, but these people actually are still at work, but they only get paid the 534 uh, given by the state. Okay, they may get an extra you know, uh, a few euros, but there are companies that are playing the system like that. And so they are not paying their workers anymore. Uh, the state pays 534 euros. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people are living in that condition in the uh, food industry, in the, uh, in other sectors. And then the system also, uh, allows you somehow to work only part-time, 50% of your normal time, and uh, uh, you then uh, receive, of course, a smaller wage, about 20% less than what you would uh, get normally. So 20% less is a, is a massive amount when you lose it. Uh, somehow what is happening now is the state is subsidizing unemployment it pays so that people stop work or stop working. Uh, I think it should be the other way around. The state should subsidize uh, employment so that people remain employed, remain in contact with, let's say, employment and an employment situation with all that goes with it. And uh, uh, they keep their job. Uh, hopefully that's, I mean, that, that's what we would like. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of workers who are hardly able to survive. I mean, there are poor workers. Uh, we don't have specific statistics about that, but I can tell you that lots of people are like that. And the unemployment level is still very, very high in Greece. Okay, yeah, uh, not very encouraging uh, scenario, the one you're uh, picturing. Uh, okay, uh, there is one question from the floor. Marlon Laksamana from Migrant Europe. Um, I can see your question. I'm going to give you the floor, but please bear in mind that this is a trade unionists um, uh, forum. Maybe we are not too much up to uh, migrant issues. There is within the uh, European Forum um, this year, 2020, there has been uh, a specific uh, forum about uh, migration. But if, uh, please, I'll give you the floor and see if Yota uh, have an answer for your question. Go ahead, uh, Marlon. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Anyways, uh, 
we do consider ourselves as migrant workers and also as trade unionists because we also try to organize unions amongst uh, like migrants here in Europe. And so basically my question is like, as workers, as migrant workers here and who are unionized and who are not recognized by, the, by a lot of states here within the European Union, what did the unions do? Because we need, uh, at this time of the great pandemic, we want solidarity on the things that we use and work on. So basically, I just want to know what the Greeks did, because I know uh, coming from our members in Greece from different countries or different nationalities who were part of the unions of undocumented migrants is that they suffered a lot. So I just want to know if the trade unions or you know solidarity groups, the leftist groups were able to help them in that precarious uh, position that they were. So I guess that's it. Ναι, η απάντηση δεν είναι μόνο σήμαντη. Στην Ελλάδα έχουμε μεγάλο πρόβλημα όσον αφορά... I think that indeed, uh, in, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about Greece, but we have a serious problem, of course, uh, with uh, migration. I'm not saying migrants are a problem, I'm saying we have uh, a situation that is problematic and we have of course as trade unions supported and are still supporting the integration of migrants uh, into society uh, we want and we do show solidarity with the migrants there are uh, specific problems uh, for example in one of the uh, camps that has been set up uh, in uh, the island of Mytilene um, we need uh, to play a role and we do believe that as trade unions we have a role to play to ensure that there is no discrimination between Greek and non-Greek workers, which is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, the, 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 the right wing is trying to do. They're trying to cultivate this sort of uh, difference uh, between Greeks and non-Greeks. But I think when trade unions are involved and actively involved, uh, they can play a major role and a useful role to support migrants, even though the situation of migrants is extremely complicated. And yes, there needs to be more, more needs to be done to support migrants. Thank you. Indeed, um, I'm, I'm sure that we all agree with you, Yota. Um, there is time for uh, one last question. If uh, anyone from the floor if not i i'm i still have <laughs> quite a few questions for yota but i'll give uh, the opportunity to um the people attending this uh, session to make a question if anyone is ready well if not if not uh, yota i'm going to make you one last question um uh, before and then we will release you uh, for a while, because at the end, yeah, there might be another question for you, who knows. But uh, I have one more thing uh, about you, uh, to, to ask you about, um, which is um, uh, the situation you have described about the most vulnerable workers having no choice but to go to the workplace because they cannot work for, from home. Uh, do you think uh, uh, that these workers are usually the those with the worst uh, economic conditions, social conditions? Is there a relation? Is there a link between those people having to go to to work to their uh, to the workplace, not being able to stay at home, and uh, precarious uh, uh, situation, low wages, no, not good salaries. Do you think there is a link there? Αυτό που ήθελα να πω είναι ότι συνήθως μιλάμε για την τηλεργασία. What I can tell you is that uh, usually, uh, well, when you talk about telework in general, uh, people focus on the positive dimension of working from home. Uh, but there are also negative uh, dimensions associated to working from home. Uh, you don't always have the right environment. You have uh, a limited ability to uh, uh, respect 
your working time. Uh, you have to also do very often two or three jobs at the same time. That is your job, plus taking care of your kids, plus possibly taking care of your elderly parents uh, sometimes or the rest of your family. And also the problem is that uh, I think uh, the conditions are not the same. Uh, if you are um, an executive, if you're a manager, uh, working from home gives you more freedom. But if you are not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, at a high or in a high position, then often you, you're not even given that possibility and you go to work because you have to. Uh, so to answer your question, my, my comment would be, the problem with this is it's, this, it's unfair. Of course, you go to work and as you said, there are risks. You take the bus, you take public transport uh, and you run the risk of being infected. Now, if you are uh, somebody who uh, lives in a nice uh, environment, you drive your nice car to work and you go into your nice plush office with, of course, no problem of, you know, social distancing because you have your own private office. So that's where it's unfair, whether you go to work or not. What matters is the conditions that you face when going to work and when you're at work. And I think what uh, unions need to do there is uh, is be present. In banks, which is the sector I know most of, uh, in banks we fought here uh, in Greece to say that everybody should be treated in the same way, whether you are the director of a bank or you are a subcontractor who's asked to come into a bank, uh, uh, the bank premises for a few hours a day. Uh, uh, and I think it's uh, something that's that's not easy to understand. Uh, and I uh, remember that we uh, were saying sometimes it's unfair, you should test everybody, not just uh, the workers that come uh, or work for your bank as, as, as employees, you should also uh, test everyone else. We had to wait until one subcontractor was infected to make that point. So there's a, a problem with the, 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 the unfairness of the overall situation. I don't know if I answered your question and whether it was clear. Uh, yes, indeed, you answer uh, by far what I in, intended, uh, intended to ask. Uh, so, Yota, thank you very much for your words, uh, for your history, for your information. Really inspiring. Uh, please uh, be around just in case there are more questions towards the end of, uh, uh, of this forum today. And uh, thank you again uh, for sharing all this uh, with us. So, now, Sorry if you see me in the screen going with my hands from one way to another, but it's I'm using my uh, my mobile phone, so it's a little bit uncomfortable uh, to for these occasions. But um, okay, let's move now to the next uh, panelist, uh, Heinz Heinz Bierbaum. Uh, Heinz is the current uh, president of the European Left Party and former deputy chairman of the German Left. Uh, uh, the German left party, Die Linke. Um, Heinz studied in, uh, in Freiburg and Berlin and graduated as a sociologist. Also doctorated in economics and social sciences in 1977. So Heinz, uh, that was a long time ago. What do you want to share with us today? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Enrique. Uh, I was also uh, for a long time working for the trade unions for the IG Metall, you forgot that. This is also a very important experience for me. And I'm still a trade unionist, also as politician and also as scientist. Uh, I was always um, very engaged concerning the trade unions. And um, I should talk about uh, labor rights and uh, labor conditions. And I think it was very clearly sh shown by Jota that in times of crisis, 
which we are facing now, and we are facing really a very deep crisis, labor, uh, worker ri workers' rights, and also trade unions are under pressure. We have, that's, that's quite clear. And we had the same experience in the very deep financial and economic crisis 2008, 2009. And because uh, very often uh, contracts was suspended, also Jota talked about that, that uh, contracts are suspended and the trade unions uh, come under pressure and the worker rights were reduced. And I think it's typical for neoliberal politics to reduce workers' rights and to weaken trade unions. We saw this very clearly concerning, for example, the so-called uh, labor market reforms, the neoliberal market, uh, labor market reforms, for example, in France and in Italy. In France, we had a big uh, um, conflict concerning the so-called reform of the labor statutes, the change of the labor statutes, the change of Code du Travail. And we had the same uh, with the Jobs Act in Italy, for example. There were a lot of resistance by the unions, but in the end, these reforms were implemented. And what are the characteristics of those uh, uh, so-called reforms, neoliberal reforms? Uh, they intend to more flexibility. They intend to have less protection uh, against dismissals, less social protection. And in particular, they prefer company agreements instead of collective agreements negotiated by the unions. And therefore, because they are weakened the collective bargaining power of trade unions, they are weakening trade unions. That's the problem we are facing, in particular in times of crisis. And uh, uh, we need in the crisis quite the opposite. We should uh, improve workers' rights. We should improve, uh, we should strengthen the uh, trade unions because we need trade, uh, strong trade unions with strong collective bargaining power. I think that's, is, that's what we need in these times. And I think Esther from the European um, Trade Union Confederation will talk a little bit more concerning collective bargaining, because I think it's a core activity of trade unions, the collective bargainings. And we are still uh, confronted with a situation that uh, collective, uh, agreement, uh, collective agreements are reduced in favor of company agreements, for example, and therefore the collective bargaining power of uh, trade unions is weakened and the trade unions are weakened. And um, we need, of course, also more social rights and, and uh, an improvement of worker rights. I would like uh, to refer also to the European level as we all know, uh, there is something also on the European level concerning social rights. We have the so-called pillar of social rights, but this is just a declaration and th these are not binding uh, social rights. And therefore there was a proposal um, promoted by uh, many trade unionists, also by the uh, European uh, uh, Trade Union Confederation to transform the social pillar in a so-called social protoc protocol with uh, binding social rights. I think this is very important. And I would like also to refer to the European level because very mostly trade unions uh, act on, mostly they act on national level. And I think that is one of our deficits that we don't have really very strong European cooperation because in this crisis we are facing today, it's not a national uh, crisis, it's a, a worldwide crisis, it's a European crisis, not only European, it's worldwide. And therefore we have to strengthen our European cooperation also between the trade unions. And there is one thing, in my opinion, very often neglected that uh, the, I'm referring to the, so, uh, to the European Works Councils because we have since many years a European directive uh, 
that it is possible for uh, uh, European companies to have to install European works councils. And European works council, according to the directive, they have the right of information and consultation. I know very well that the rights of European works councils are limited, but we should use it. I know it's very often, very often difficult to have right uh, information, correct information in time. And very often the consultation is very weak, but on the other hand, it's the only uh, organization on shop floor level with the European Works Council, and we should need them also for the European cooperation. And we had also some uh, positive experiences. We have a lot of negative experience also, but I was uh, for uh, many years also a coordinator for uh, European Works Councils with a ma mandate uh, from Industry All, the European Federation of Industrial Trade Unions. And I think they are useful in, in particular in uh, cases of uh, restructuring and because they could uh, help the national works council and also the European level to avoid harmful consequences of uh, company restructuring processes. And therefore, in my opinion, we should also refer to this European level and to talk about also about European works councils. And uh, uh, to conclude, I would like to say that uh, it's very, very important that we cooperate in order to strengthen the trade unions, the cooperation between the uh, European trade unions, because in times of crisis, and that was also the outcome of uh, that was Jota was explaining uh, uh, in the speech of Jota, that we need really very strong trade unions and we uh, have to resist against the attempts uh, to reduce workers' rights and in particular to weaken trade unions because strong trade unions are very important. They are cru crucial to defend the interests of the workers and the employees. That's just for introduce to this uh, panel. Well, um, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Heinz. It's uh, uh, as usual, uh, we know each other for a number of years now. Of course, that uh, my introduction was kind of a joke. What can you say uh, in, in this forum? You can say many, many, many things because of your, uh, of your past activities. And uh, I, I left aside uh, your relationship with uh, IG Metal on purpose. <laughs> I knew you was going to, to mention that. And of course, uh, it uh, has uh, left um, a very clear uh, mark in, in your experience and there, it was clear in, in, in your presentation. So, well, you know that um, I have a couple of questions for all the participants. You know the questions by heart, what are the uh, experience, uh, what kind of experience uh, have you learned or has taught you this uh, crisis uh, from the perspective of, of your position, being the leader of an, uh, a political organization? And what kind of changes would you propose uh, in order to uh, face in a better shape uh, another crisis? Yes, I uh, already, uh, Jota was saying we have to be better organized. I think that's very important. And I think we should have a better cooperation between the political left and the trade unions, because also for the political left, the trade, uh, the cooperation with the trade unions is crucial. And we have to come up with own proposals. For example, the party of the European left created and promoted a platform how to get out of the crisis in a social way. Of course, protecting the people, protecting the population, to have another economic policy, to have more social rights, to defend democracy. And also, I think that's also very often neglected in these times. We have to be, uh, to do more for uh, disarmament and peace. And of course, international solidarity uh, just in those times, it's really, really very important. But I think we have to come up with own proposals we have to be more visible because that's our problem. Because in these times, 
where we are needed as really uh, where uh, uh, progressive forces and uh, strong progressive forces and strong trade unions are needed. We are not really in the center of the uh, social debate. Uh, we are, uh, and therefore we have to come up with own proposals and we have to be better organized and better coordinated. I think the cooperation between us is very, very important. And I think that's the aim of the European Forum. Forum. Unfortunately, this year only online. Uh, everybody would prefer a presidential meeting, but that's not possible to, uh, because I think for a European Forum, it's also very important uh, networking. That's uh, so we have some limits uh, in, an, in an online forum. But nevertheless, I appreciate that we meet also in this uh, uh, format because we need this cooperation. We need this cooperation between the different experiences, different, and we see we have the same problems. We have perhaps, may, we could, we may have different conditions and different situation between in the different uh, European countries. But at the end, uh, we are discovering that we have the same problems and we have to cooperate and we have to, uh, to uh, and that's what we need is, and I think it's still our, the, the, the biggest challenge to come at the end to joint action. Perfect. Um, thank you, Heinz. Uh, so there are many, the, the, the possibilities to, uh, that you are opening with uh, your words uh, are endless. But I'd rather go uh, for the participants in this seminar to make questions. So, guys, uh, the floor is yours if uh, you want to make a question to Heinz. Yeah, there's one already from Georgos Gogos. Um, and I think I he's. I can see that uh, Georgos, Georgos Gogos, uh, there is a question from Georgos. If you want to take the floor, Georgos. Yes, good afternoon to, to everybody. Uh, it's a uh, very interesting uh, uh, this evening and uh, unfortunately we're not uh, in the same uh, in the same room. Uh, what I would like to, to ask uh, Heinz. Um, Is if there are uh, certain proposals, so was Nana. Bona milos telnika. This online web. Ora, lipon. Ευχαριστώ. Αυτό που θα ήθελα να ρωτήσω τον Χάινς είναι αν υπάρχουν συγκεκριμένες προτάσεις. So the question uh, I'd like to ask uh, to Heinz is: uh, Are there concrete proposals uh, to uh, achieve? a truly international cooperation among you. So is there anything that you can propose to us to achieve that international cooperation between unions? Because uh, I work uh, with uh, 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 harbor workers and we have the International Council uh, or organization of harbor workers. And I think the same type of organization has been set up also for rail workers. So my question is, is there any way we can uh, maybe establish similar structures that will facilitate cooperation internationally in other sectors, possibly? Um, and then we know that uh, trade unions have uh, politically uh, often a different backgrounds. Uh, they have different routes and different approaches, politically speaking. Is that a problem or is that a chance? May I answer, Enrique? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you very much, Georgios. Uh, yes, it's true. We have some international uh, organization. We have the Transport Workers Organization, Transnational, for example. You mentioned the harbors, and, and we have in also in other branches. Is this. 
and uh, we have, of course, also international trade unions. And I want also to refer to, for example, to the European uh, trade unions, uh, industry all for the industrial uh, trade unions, and uh, also in the other branches we have this. But that what we need is uh, to have a real uh, exchange between the experience between the different uh, trade unions and the different countries. And therefore we created many years ago uh, uh, the Trade Unionist Network Europe. This is a network, a grassroots network between trade unionists of different countries. And we had last week a conference because we are always having uh, once or twice a year, a conference of uh, the this trade unionist uh, network Europe with the support of the left group in the European Parliament, the GUI NGL, now it's called the left in the European Parliament, which I really highly appreciate this name, of course. And uh, so we have uh, once or twice a year a conference and uh, concerning the situation of the trade unions, the struggles and how to combine and how to, to, to support struggles. For example, we, we supported uh, the strike of the, uh, of the employees and workers of Ryanair, of Amazon and others. And we, have, we are uh, addressing some really very important topics for trade unions. For example, last week I had a, uh, a debate concerning the minimum wage. It's also a little bit controversial between the different unions. And therefore, I think it's a very a concrete and very important uh, experience, this trade unionist network Europe. And I, I would like to, uh, to suggest that this assembly of trade unionists, because we have also to uh, um, raise the question how to continue, that we should in uh, the future uh, work together, uh, the, uh, the trade unionists here in the assembly, the assembly of the trade unionists within the European Forum and the trade unionist network of Europe. So we have the possibility to strengthen our cooperation. And we have, of course, to, talk, uh, to, uh, to, to get in touch and to cooperate also with the already existing uh, organizations uh, of trade unions on the European level. Voila, thank you, Heinz. Now, um, I have three questions for you. And uh, I will, I'm going to give the floor to the three people making the questions. Uh, please be brief and same for you, uh, Heinz, because uh, we have like 10, 12 minutes uh, to uh, end this session. So first Manuela, Manuela Krop, then Maite Ledesma, and last but not least, Joseph Healy. So Manuela, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Enrique, and thank you very much, uh, Heinz, for your presentation, and also thanks to Jutta. I just have a specific question. Maybe it's too specific. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I can just tell you from the insights in the automotive sector, which has value chains uh, all over the European Union and all over Europe, that there is uh, now, of course, going on the fight when it comes to layoffs and cuts, and, uh, and the car industry is is uh, planning to reduce production capacities. And uh, we have heard from, I work for the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and we have heard from different trade unions in different member states that they lack information by the, by the car manufacturers. They are not involved in any decision-making. They have the feeling that they have, are put against each other now, like the, the, the competition is enforced, enforced. Uh, so the question would be, uh, uh, what are your proposals or not proposals, but maybe suggestions, how these trade unions could cooperate in uh, such a difficult situation? Thank you very much. Um, Enrique, could I may I, uh, answer immediately? Yeah. So thank you very much, Manuela, for your question. I think it's really very important because we are facing a lot of 
uh, big problems and transformation processes, in particular in the automotive industry. We have the same experience in the different countries because we have the ecological challenges. We have to reduce the CO2 emissions and therefore I think we have, there are really very big, not only so ecological, but also big social challenges in this um, uh, in, in the automotive in the industry in particular. And therefore, we should have an, ex an exchange between the different experiences in the different countries. And therefore, I think uh, uh, also we should use the European Works Councils for uh, addressing the transformation process in the auto, uh, automotive industry, because you know, the, the companies, the corporates of the automotive industry, they are not national, they are international, they are transnational uh, uh, companies, and therefore I think we could use really also the European Works Council, but we have also to uh, have a cooperation between the different trade unions, national trade unions, and I know that, for example, industry all, the European uh, trade union, uh, the Federation of uh, the European Federation of uh, Industrial Trade Union is organizing that and it's dedicated also to uh, these challenges. And there is one proposal, one concept uh, by the International Trade Union Confederation. It's called Just Transition and it's a combination uh, of uh, ecological and social, of the combination of the ecological and social dimension of these processes. And I think also the conferences, for example, organized by Rosa Luxemburg's uh, foundation is also an opportunity to have, uh, to have it not only national, but to organize European international conferences. So the, there is a possibility to cooperate. I think there is a, there is an, there's absolutely a need to cooperate concerning these big challenges, for example, in the automotive industry. And it's also an opportunity for us. It's also an opportunity for the, la for the trade unions and for the political left as well. Thank you, Heinz. Still two questions uh, for you, um, Maitet Ledesma. Secretary General from the International Migrant Alliance. Please state your question quick. Thank you. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my question is, um, you know, in the time of the pandemic, a lot of uh, workers, of course, have been laid off. But um, a lot of workers, especially in the service sector, have been quite affected. And um, as you well know, that, you know, domestic workers are among the most of um, workers that have also been affected in, uh, in the service sector work. Many of them are contractual, but in many European countries as well, uh, they are not even formally integrated into the labor market. My question is what can trade unions do for this uh, sector of workers? And if trade unions are also addressing these issues and how are they addressing the issues? Because uh, trade unions also need to step up um, strengthening their relations with uh, especially these workers who have lost uh, their jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Maitet. I think that's really a big uh, question. It's a big challenge for trade unions to organize, in particular, so-called precarious workers, migrants, and so on, and uh, the workers which are not really integrated in the labor market. It's a challenge for the trade unions, and it's still, frankly spoken, an, uh, a deficit of trade union activities. We should do more uh, for to integrate those workers, and it's very. But I know it's very complicated. For example, in Italy exists a special uh, trade union for precarious and for uh, workers. It's called Needle, and the experience to organize those workers is really. Um, a very difficult experience. There are many efforts, but uh, not very often uh, uh, successful. But uh, you are uh, certainly right that we should do more to integrate those workers because they are the most affected by the crisis. Perfect. So um, 
One last question in this moment uh, from Joseph. Joseph Healy, you have the floor, please. Hello, hello, Heinz. I'm, I'm actually working as we speak, as I've been working remotely for the last uh, nine months or so. But uh, I'm active in Unite, which is one of the biggest trade unions in the UK. And I'm interested in what you said about the, the um, international network, I, if you could send more details. Uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about is that with the Brexit deal, where most people think some sort of deal will be reached, that a lot of labour rights and so on in the UK as a result will be considerably weakened. And I am concerned that the UK trade unions don't seem to be playing as active a role within the European trade union movement as they have before. So uh, I would just like your comments about that. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, that's also my concern that uh, as a consequence of the Brexit, uh, the integration of the uh, British trade unions is not that it was perhaps in the past. And also in the past, we had some difficulties, you know, but I think the trade unions in particular in, in, in the UK are really very, very important. We have a special situation because they are very often linked to the Labour parties and they play different roles. Uh, and therefore we should uh, strengthen, you know, Joseph, our cooperation with the left and with the trade unions in the UK. I think that's something also we should, we, we, we have to discuss within the party of the European left. And therefore I think it's also, we do our best concerning also the trade unionist network Europe to integrate also the trade unionist uh, from the UK, and I think this is a way, but I, I have the same con concern you have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Caroli, we are under a very, very, very tight schedule because the next panelist uh, needs to leave at uh, quarter to six. So if you have a quick, 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 real quick question, go ahead, Caroli. And by the way, I'm having a problem. I am not receiving the questions from the floor. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, very quickly. Uh, yes, we have to be proactive. We have to look for the future. And here I have to say a tribute to Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, which at least regarding the automotive industry's future have begun an extremely good work with good experience and experts. Now, tell, I just want to tell you one big challenge, and that is something for all of us, especially in the countries of the Central and Eastern European part. Most of the workers are employed in micro and small enterprises. In Hungary, 71% of the enterprises registered are micro and small enterprises, totally out of the reach of trade unions. And they are the real precarious workers who have no protection, no collective bargaining and collective agreement uh, coverage. In Hungary, it's lower than 20%. In Austria, 97%. And with that, I tell the real problem. We need to integrate them, but trade unions lack the capacity to do so. They even lack the capacity, not only the will, but the capacity to cater for the already members. And that is something we have to address. And I would ask European left and also Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung especially to address these questions and help us because there are very good experiences also within the Central and Eastern European countries, how to do work, this work, and we can be helpful. That's it. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much. I totally agree because this is our one of our biggest problems because uh, the most of the workers are uh, working in uh, small and middle-sized uh, companies, not in the big companies, that's different. And we have to also to take uh, into consideration that the union density is declining. And therefore we have a big problem. And uh, in particular concerning the central and eastern parts of uh, uh, countries of Europe, we have very often 
also a very diff a difficult situation concerning different unions, because the union, the trade unions, because we have very often uh, not united unions. We have very often uh, uh, divided uh, trade unions and different organizations, many organizations of those. And therefore, I totally agree. This is really a very, very big problem which we have to address. Voila, perfect. Thank you very much, Heinz. Thank you very much uh, to all the um, uh, people in the in the session making the questions. We are almost by the minute uh, following the schedule, so now it's time to uh, give the floor for uh, to our next panelist, which is Esther Lynch. Um, Esther, uh, which by the way, she works in the office one floor below mine. <laughs> But marvelous of these technicalities uh, of the technicalities of these times. Uh, now we are going to see each other uh, via this uh, platform. So um, Esther was elected as a deputy general secretary of the ETUC uh, in 2019, having previously been a confederal secretary also of the ETUC. She has an extensive experience of the trade union movement, both in Ireland at, uh, at European and international level. Before joining the ETUC, she, uh, she was the Legislation and Social Affairs Officer of the Irish uh, Congress of Trade Unions. And uh, well, see if there is someone that knows a lot about what's going on today in, uh, in the European Union and in Europe uh, regarding trade unions. It's, uh, it's you, Esther, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Enrique, and good evening, colleagues. And Heinz, I just want to say how much I appreciated your uh, interventions and your answers to the to the questions. Um, as, as Enrique says, my office is actually below him, but because of the COVID measures today, I'm in my kitchen. So I hope you can all hear me um, okay. So um, uh, uh, I think Heinz made a very good point in its, and it and it was in relation to the question that was asked, which is, um, how do we manage the fallout of COVID, which is uh, the tsunami of job losses uh, that we're going to be facing into uh, after Christmas time? You know, so 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 I think there there is there there there, there is an, a tsunami about to face us, and of course the only way uh, that we can secure a fair transition uh, where we where we protect every single job that can be protected is to get the union into the companies. Uh, so my colleague Isabel Schumann has a petition uh, to do to to call on the EU to do exactly that. So I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask my colleague Lorenzo to put that petition into the chat and the link there. And perhaps during uh, during my, my 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 five or ten minutes, if people would take the opportunity uh, to sign that petition, and and we can get activism going even during uh, the conference. So, 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 so colleagues to, to thank you about that. What I also wanted to do is I've sent you two slides, Rike, can you, can you, can you put, put, put them up here? Yeah, so I've sent you an email with two, just, just with two slides. And what the two slides do is they show the situation relating to collective bargaining before we went into the crisis. Um, and then we can discuss a bit about, you know, where we see, where, where our assessment is of where things are now. So, so, so the first slide, gonna come up any second now, shows union density in Europe. So, so, so one of the slides is union density and the other is coverage by collective agreements. Just a quick question, Esther, was Daniele in copy of uh, that email? Uh, Lorenzo would have sent it. So if you give Lorenzo permission, Lorenzo can put it up. If you can do that or... Um... Just a second, I'll give him. Perfect, that will be much useful. Thank you. Yeah. Lorenzo, so Lorenzo, we're rocking and rolling. Can you, can you put it up? Excellent. That's my man Lorenzo. So, so, um, so the as you can see, exactly as Caroli from Hungary was pointing out, the difference between member states in terms of the number of workers covered by collect, collective agreements is phenomenal. So, 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 what we need to think about in our strategies 
is how do we use the bargaining strength of where we're strong to begin to help us where we're weaker? And that's one of the things we've been struggling with is looking at how, how, do, we, how do we use the power of strong trade unions? Not to do the work of the weaker trade unions because that would be quite wrong. But how do we, how do we begin to, uh, for example, the union who, who is respected by the head office, uh, very often in Western parts of Europe, uh, well respected, the union can go in and can that union begin to say, it matters to us if you refuse to collectively bargain with the union in the East. Because exactly as, as the colleague from Greece was saying, it's divide and conquer. Brexit is gonna be divide and conquer. All of it is gonna be divide and conquer. It's the, it's, the, it's the oldest playbook in town, but my goodness, it keeps being wheeled out in new ways all of the time. So going into the crisis, this was, was, the, was the picture on collective bargaining coverage. Next slide, Lorenzo. And of course, closely linked to that is density. So how, how, many, uh, how much of the population of the working population is a member of, of a trade union? And as you can see, the situation is slightly worse. So, 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 and if we plotted this over time, the trajectory would be downwards. It wouldn't be upwards, it would be downwards. So going into this crisis, we were not going into this crisis with, uh, with, with, with uh, a lot of people uh, being, being members of unions, even though they want to be. Studies time and time again in each member state where workers are asked, are you in a union? They say no, and they say, would you like to be? They say yes. And then, and then there's a little list of reasons that they will give. And top of the list, top of the list is my employer won't like it. So, 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 so before everybody, and I, and I know that the commission is every now and again has, has these little forays uh, where they have uh, uh, reports in which they say, well, trade unions are not really relevant to, to new groups of workers. They say trade unions are not really relevant to platform workers or trade unions are not really relevant to, 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 to migrant workers. None of that could be farther from the truth. Trade unions are hugely relevant, particularly for vulnerable workers. But the missing piece is the power in the hands of the workers to be able to join a union without fear. So that's why it's so important what we're trying to do now with this directive of minimum wage and collective bargaining. What we're trying to do with that directive is to, is to make sure that member states have in place sufficient protections for people so that they can join a union and exercise their right to collectively bargain. That's really what we're trying to do with that directive. We've, we've not yet secured it though. So we will need your help in the coming six months during the Portuguese presidency to change the wording of that directive so that it recognizes that collective bargaining is, is something trade unions do and that it makes sure that every worker who wants to join a union and collectively bargain for fair, for fair pay, because fair pay is not minimum wage. Fair pay is, the, is your fair share of the profit that you help to create, the value that you create for the organization. So, so what we want to see within that directive is, is, is the commitment that's currently in it, the provision that currently says that member states must increase the number of workers covered by a collective agreement, that that provision is amended to say not only must it increase the number of workers covered by a collective agreement, but member states must make sure that they have effective, genuine remedies in place so that people can join a union without fear and that employers are obliged to respect the workforce when they want to collectively bargain uh, through their trade union whether that's at company level or at sector level, all of that has to be properly protected. And I think then finally, there, there's one additional um, uh, opportunity I'd like to ask all your help with as well. And that's the Gender Pay Transparency Directive. Now, a lot of, work of, of, of union officials here will have been scarred from previous battles where we try to fight for 
recognition of work of equal value. Now, work of equal value, as you know, uh, has been uh, rejected uh, in, in a lot of courts. And that's the missing piece. That's, that's the key piece. That, that's, that's, that's one of the major blocks within the gender pay gap. It's that the descriptions that, of jobs that are predominantly done by women, and then there are descriptions of jobs predominantly done by men, and the content of the jobs done by men, even though it's very, very similar, if not the same, is valued higher than the jobs that are predominantly done by women. Um, so what we want to have done uh, within uh, the Gender Pay Transparency Directive is, is to strengthen the power of the union so that the union can take and, uh, and, and can demand uh, uh, collective bargaining uh, on work, work of equal value and finally address uh, the pay injustice that all those cleaners, all those carers, and all those shop workers currently have, the front line of the front line, turning up every day, putting their lives at risk, and struggling to make, to put food on, on the table for the family at the end of the week, heat their homes, and put a roof over their head. So, 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 so for us, um, it's all to play for. Uh, the union movement uh, is, 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 is united in identifying that improvements are absolutely necessary. There is some, as there always is in every member state and in every struggle, some differences about the strategy and the tactics that, that will get us there. Um, but, 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 but anybody who thinks uh, that the union movement doesn't, doesn't think that, um, that, that, that that change is needed is quite wrong. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so, so oh, I guess over to you guys. Happy to take questions uh, uh, and and to thank you for inviting the ETUC to be part part of these discussions. Well, um, thank you very much, Esther. Um, as I said at the beginning, I was sure that you were going to give a very complete picture of what is going on uh, regarding the trade union movement in Europe, as it, it couldn't be any other way, way else. So um, I. Uh, I'm bound to make you the two same questions I did to the uh, previous speakers, or, although you have more or less answer to both the questions, which is, uh, the first is, what are the conclusions, what have you learned from uh, these, uh, from facing this crisis from your current position today, being uh, um, in, in the ETUC, and what changes uh, would you uh, uh, suggest in order to make your organization stronger for a crisis like this in the future? So, so, so I think the, the, the major lesson of this crisis is that unions were fast with solutions. We were able to identify solutions and were able to negotiate them and governments were interested in that. But what we learned in the last crisis and what we learned in every single other crisis before this is, is that as soon as the crisis crisis is over, the role of trade unions is pretty put much to the back of the queue when it comes to the recovery. So we're now struggling to have our rightful role recognized and included as, as, as part of the recovery. And let's make no mistake about it. All of the productivity gains, the, 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 the productivity gains that in the past would have gone into, into, into the pockets of working people, haven't, haven't done that for the last 20 years. And the consequence of that has been that people have no savings, that they have nothing to fall back on. People have, people going from week to week to week, you know, like, 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 like not, a, not able to, 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 to prepare for anything remotely like this. And it's not just us saying this, the EU's research said it as well. One third of people, no savings whatsoever. Another third of, of, of of workers had maximum, absolute maximum of two months savings. So, 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 so the consequence of the non-sharing uh, of the productivity gains with workers, and the reason for that being because we're not, we won't, we have been struggling to be able to organize in trade unions because of the growth in anti-union tactics. We've seen Amazon importing tactics from a hundred years ago. Um, we've seen them uh, using private investigators to, 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 to spy on workers, 
uh, to threaten them. Um, and, and all of you who've been on a picket line have experienced that type of intimidation. And you know, and you know, and you know how, how, how frightening it is, even when you're a tough cookie like all of us are. It's still frightening. And it's one thing to, to be brave for, your, for yourself, it's quite another to be brave for your family. And, and these new techniques, these surveillance techniques, these, these, these ways of making workers fearful and using the fear of the COVID, using fear of financial ruin, all of these things, um, we need to, you're right, we need, we, we need to have a stronger strategy. But at the heart of our strategy, our solution is still real. Our solution is to, to help workers organize in unions, help unions to, to have the power so that they can bargain properly and to make sure, exactly as Heinz said, we're, 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 we're in a global pandemic recession. Sound economics boosts internal demand during a, pandem a global pandemic recession. And so what we need to do is to get more money into the hands of working people. And how do we do that? Strong collective bargaining. And I'm sorry, I'm just one, one tune all the time, but this really is, is the song. The song is, we need to, we need to boost uh, uh, unions' power. We need to make sure workers can join a union without fear. Um, and, we need, and we need better tools to help us do that. And my goodness, we need member states on our side, not on the employer's side. And we need the EU Commission on our side, not on the employer's side on this. There's no neutral side on this. They have to join us on our side and help us. Thank you, Esther. I believe that you have hit uh, the bullseye because, uh, and uh, also the, the, the most tricky question of all. I mean, uh, uh, as long as we have a uh, neoliberal oriented um, government, uh, we will have a neoliberal oriented uh, commission and therefore the proposals coming from that spot are going to be very difficult to, to fight. Now, um, time for questions from the floor. Uh, I can't see if there are any, uh, someone willing to make Esther a question. She has just 10 minutes to stay around with us. Anyone? I see that Maite has uh, raised her hand. Um, and she's still around, so she can uh, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, hello again. Uh, my question to Esther is, um, what do you think uh, is, the, are the role of, is the role of workers in defining a perspective of a post-pandemic economy in Europe? Thank you. So, so it's hard to answer that question. Um, I think that that workers often have a much better analysis of what's going on than a lot of politicians have. Mostly because they live the reality of the bad decisions. Uh, so, 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 so I think that, 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 that there's no doubt but that workers have solutions. I think the challenge at the current moment is uh, one which the ETUC is facing up to and trying to identify solutions for, which is to guarantee the involvement of trade unions in the construction and implementation of the recovery packages. Now we tried, um, and, and, I, and I thought we would, we would get further along than we did. Um, we tried to secure um, within uh, the uh, recovery package and the shore, which is the the, the job protection uh, program, that the money would go to companies, that, that companies would be privileged if they had a collective agreement and if they, and if they recognized their workers uh, right to, to collectively bargain. Um, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna major on that in the um, uh, January period. We're gonna major on changing public procurement rules so that only companies that, so, so that basically so that any company that refuses to bargain would also be excluded from state money, whether it's EU money. Now, no, 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 we haven't lost that battle yet, but we haven't won it either. So, 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 um, so we have a strong strategy in place. We're gonna be talking about 
harmful public procurement. We're going to be talking about um, uh, harmful uh, lack of involvement uh, of unions. I mean, the problem, like, like putting it bluntly, is that I could paper the, war of, the walls of my flat here with uh, great statements <laughs> that, that the, from the commission or ourselves and the employers have signed or, or, there, or there these great statements saying, we value social dialogue and the involvement of the social partners. Um, and then when it, when it comes to, to the rubber hitting the road of, of unions being uh, genuinely listened to at member state level, all of our affiliates, many of whom are here, will tell you that that's, that that's not the reality. That, that's, that a lot of it is a tick box exercise. So, 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 the, so, so, so um, in December, I'm bringing a resolution to the ETUC, which is all about implementation, which is gonna say, we don't have statements anymore unless there's an implementation uh, uh, paragraph in it, because we have to be able to check, is this really happening? Because other than that, we're beginning to lose credibility. So, um, so, 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 so my long-winded answer to that is, is that is that workers have solutions. The unions are able to craft them and to and to deliver them. The missing piece is the is the respect and the we say the 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 envelope um, in which in which we can get get into bargaining uh, either at, at company level, sector level, or at member state level. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. I don't know if there is someone else willing to make a question. Yes, Marlon again. There we go, Marlon. Oh, wait. Marlon, please. Uh, sorry, uh, I was just about to ask, like, how can we ensure that all workers are going to work together regardless of their status? Because right now we're seeing a lot of difficulties when it comes to uh, our sector, or at least the migrant workers who's trying to integrate. Like we've already experienced a lot of our uh, workers who are working in the trucking industry who have been exploited during this pandemic. We've seen how seafarers have lost their, uh, you know, uh, sanity in being left on the sea for the longest time, and yet we don't see the unions working or helping and 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 trying to, you know, uplift the spirits of these people. So maybe I would like to ask, like the unions, how can they ensure at least the European unions? Yeah, so, um, so, so, so although, although the unions might always be visible, I can, I can assure you that, that, they, that, we, that, 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 that the unions are, they know about those problems, are trying to organize workers and trying to come up with solutions uh, that will work. Um, in relation to, uh, in particular, uh, in relation to um, migrant workers, we have uh, established uh, an, an organization called Migrant Net, and what that helps uh, trade unions officials to do. So officials who are the front line of the union, uh, meeting with workers who are affected and uh, trying to come up, you know, trying to help them with solutions. So, so Migrant Net has lots of uh, uh, examples of things that have worked for union officials. So, and that, and, and, and that is a very active network. Uh, lots of union officials, uh, Making sure that they're that they that they're properly representing uh, workers, whether whether for, for whatever reason uh, they are they have migrated for work, uh, whether they're European citizens, whether they're whether they're not European citizens, and whether they're documented or undocumented. Um, uh, so, uh, so 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 I I don't know that it's right to say that unions aren't interested, but what I do know is this is that uh, unions, we are our members. So what's really important is to try and uh, uh, organize branches, organize branches uh, that deal with um, uh, these um, uh, uh, situations. There, there, there is a union 
for every occupation. There's, 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 there's a union for every class of employment. Um, and, and, and if you're struggling finding those, um, I know the TUNE network would be helpful to you, but also at, at national level, we have national confederations who, who know all of the unions uh, and would be able to put people um, in contact. But we're not like, 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 we should never oversell what, what we do. Like what we do is we help people organize and come up with their solutions. And uh, so, so it's not that we, you know, just hand down great solutions. It's that we work with uh, communities. We work with, 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 with communities and workplaces. Uh, we work with everybody who's struggling for justice um, and uh, support that fight. Um, and and I know that, that 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 migrant communities are very powerful in their um, argument for justice, and um, very powerful in 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 identifying the injustices that they that they are currently experiencing. And um, so 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 the only thing I can say is there's loads of people here who who actually lead on those issues. I think as well. I know Unite the Union uh, is is has a has a really strong program. Um, not only live fighting the far right, you know, making sure that, uh, uh, that, 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 that the union value of equality and respect for each other or sticking together and of, and of, and of recognizing that we all rely on each other for, for our success. Um, uh, but, but there's loads of people here, you know, who'll be able to give you lots of examples of, of everything that, 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 that the unions are doing, whether it's uh, uh, seafaring unions, uh, or the or the ETF, the ITF, um, uh, industrial, um, uh, EFAT, looking after agricultural workers, putting up a really strong argument. I, I was at a meeting with them, with the with the commission, where they, where they were describing the appalling situation of 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 migrant workers working in agriculture, uh, unions in Poland fighting the the help the the, the 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 wrong classification to say that. People working in agriculture are help the harvest, and they're not really workers. Like, like, like so. So we have struggles that we're fighting all over Europe um, uh, to uh, to address the injustice. So we might not always be visible, but we but we are active. Definitely, we are there. Esther, I don't know if you. I know that you have a very very tight schedule. Do you still have time for one more question, or? If because I know that your next meeting starts. Okay, to be honest, I told you 7.45, but you have to go by 50. So I have <laughs> So, voila, one more question for Esther. She's with us for five minutes. Anyone else dares to ask anything else? Wait, because yeah. if not, if not, I have I have something that is going around my mind all the time. Uh, since I'm listening to all the uh, speakers and also to you, there is like a common understanding that uh, the democracy in Europe is becoming precarious. So that we have a system that it is supposed to be there to work for people, to work for citizens, but it's not really working for citizens. It looks like, and when I say citizens, I say everyone, uh, not because they have a passport. I mean, migrants, uh, uh, locals, the migrant problems are, are getting bigger and bigger and we need to put some support. At the same time, the democracy is, is going down the drain, if I may say that. Uh, we can see that the single market, which was also supposed there to be a, a helpful tool for all of us, is constraining and is uh, it's suffocating any attempt from trade unions to be more visible and more effective and is creating unrestrained and, and more social dumping and social dumping is dangerous because promote uh, um, uh, poverty generates working poor uh, creates uh, social unrest and racism and xenophobia so in this frame what i i really believe that your speech was really moving regarding do something not no more speeches no more declarations but put something to work um, can, what, do, what do you want to say as your final words regarding this issue? Because it's so, interesting. So you'll have to invite me back on the on the implementation because I need to I need to get the mandate from the executive for everything I'm proposing on that, which I do in December, and I know that you'll be there as well. So um, so in December on the mandate for the implementation stuff. But but I do think um uh, your your 
the discussion I think is is that there there has been an attempt to encourage everybody to think of themselves as as an individual and as an entrepreneur and whether that's in TV programs uh, so so even TV programs that are about working class communities just about everybody is an entrepreneur and um, and maybe maybe there's there's somebody who who who's an employee but they're not they're not the character that you're supposed to identify with you're supposed to identify with the entrepreneur so 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 there has been a strong cultural um uh, 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 um, amplification of the idea we're individuals and that we are all entrepreneurs. In fact, I was watching Deep Space Nine during the COVID lockdown. And in the Deep Space Nine, they were talking about a trade union. And I go, what? And they said, yeah, they said, it's on a mining planet. And I said, no, isn't that very, very dangerous? Because even in the imagined future, trade unions are all about the past. Yeah. So, so, so there's a strong cultural, we're fighting a strong cultural battle and that, and we, and we shouldn't underestimate that struggle. We shouldn't underestimate that there's no, there's no TV we can turn on. If you look back to the type of TV that was being produced uh, at the time when unions were making advances, it was about, you know, injustice. It was about us all sticking together. It was about solutions being possible as being something other than you becoming Steve Jobs. Yeah. So, 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 so that is part of the struggle that we have. The other um, part of the struggle that we have is that democracy is being presented as something you do every three or four years when you vote. And so the experience of democracy, the lived experience of democracy, um, which, which, which when you're in the workplace to be able to, to say, no, we don't think that will work, this will work. And, and to be able to, to, to be an agent of change and to be an agent of change through workplace democracy. The, 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 the removal of that and the encouragement of people to think that all politicians are the same uh, and that in some way, if you vote, you're, you're tainted. Um, all of that playing in to, to, to disempowering people from the very tool that will help them, which is collective action. So, 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 so you're creating, if you like, um, a whole, a whole poisonous environment. Um, but still given all of that, even given all of that, people are still joining unions. People still want to join unions and people believe in unions uh, as, as the way to secure a future for them and their, their families and their communities. Um, so, 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 so I like, 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 I think, I think it's still, it's still the, the, the best idea in town for us. Um, and, and, and I think, and I think the, the, the wonderful thing of these sessions is that we all see each other, we all hear each other. And, and we realize that there is a mosaic around Europe um, of, of people committed to the struggle still, that we're not on our own, that we're not all entrepreneurs. Definitely not. Uh, we have to regain the working class pride, that's for sure. Uh, too many years, uh, it's very long since they have been um, putting lots and lots of pressure about being uh, selfish and becoming, we're all entrepreneurs, as you said. Esther, thank you very much. It's now 10 to, so thanks for your time and for sharing with us all your, all this information. Bye bye, bye bye, good luck. See you soon. Um, guys, uh, we are getting closer to the end of this session. I don't know if uh, there is anyone who wants to take the floor now at this uh, moment uh, and make some kind of maybe statement or something coming deep from inside uh, after hearing to these three very interesting panelists and the things they have shared with us. Is there anyone wanting to um, take the floor before I make some uh, conclusion remarks? Uh, Enrique. Please, Yota. Ε, θα ήθελα να ξαναβάλω, δεν ξέρω αν το άκουσες πριν, το αίτημα για να ψηφίσουμε, να εκδώσουμε ένα ψήφισμα. I'd like ε... to repeat something uh, that uh, uh, was said earlier. I think, and I mentioned it earlier, there is a resolution that we've proposed against police violence, and there have been uh, cases and situations of extreme police violence against students when they were out in the streets. So I'd like everybody to sign that petition. 
it's a resolution that we want uh, 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 to ask uh, to, uh, I mean, we want to ask for your support for that resolution. And uh, I understand this is uh, a webinar on uh, trade unions, but I think it would be nice to be able to say we've come out of this with a resolution that criticizes and condemns police violence. Yes, thank you, Jota. Please remind us, uh, is this resolution already in the GUE NGL uh, page? Because it's the one that you shared with us last uh, week at the TUNE uh, meeting, right? Thank you. Uh, yes, I, then I, I, I can only uh, very much encourage all the participants to uh, follow the suggestion from Yota. And uh, you, um, I think that you will be able to find this uh, petition in the in the GUE NGL page. If I am uh, mistaken, sorry for that, but I think I'm almost certain that it must be there. So uh, listen, the, we are getting uh, close to the end of this session. Uh, as I said, I don't know if you want to add anything else. If not, um, I will start just uh, doing some uh, wrap up and, and with some general conclusions. Although I will have to uh, prepare a little bit uh, more thorough uh, for the final sessions this weekend, but uh, it's clear that we have, we have heard from uh, many perspectives uh, the same kind of messages that the, how the situation, how the environment is not working in favor of uh, workers. And most of the times uh, it, we make the right questions, but give the right, the wrong solutions from a personal perspective. Uh, probably this is a forum of uh, um, progressive forces of progressive uh, ideas. And probably everybody here is uh, supportive of progressive uh, political parties. But uh, at the same time that we complain about the lack of uh, members in trade unions, because without membership, we cannot be uh, proactive in the defense of the, of the workers' rights. Uh, we are not trade unions, we are not sufficiently involved in uh, politics or in the uh, political uh, level uh, in order to make our voice heard. And we are not able to show how important is this link because uh, probably um, if we would able to show the working class, the working people, uh, the importance of their votes or the democracy of the quality of the democracy that is not as Esther rightly pointed is democracy is not only about the casting a vote uh, every four years or five. It's about uh, having a conscience towards something. So if we cast our vote for um, options which uh, are, have clearly proven uh, uh, for many years that uh, they say something before an election, but they do differently after grasping the power uh, in, in the election, uh, then we have a problem because the trade unions will be working in, an, in a negative environment and will be very difficult for us to deliver. So I agree with uh, what has been said here. Uh, these kind of forums help us understand uh, that uh, we need to keep uh, fighting, but also keep growing. It has been said very, very clear for, uh, from IOTA, unions, 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 coordination, coordination, coordination. It is a very clear message, and I think it's uh, unavoidable that we uh, have to grow, but growing with, uh, uh, in a coordinated fashion. Uh, Heinz uh, talk about better coordination between political left and trade unions. This is paramount. And uh, um, we need that our own proposals become more visible. Also, Heinz uh, spread the same message. Uh, thank you for that, because I share it very much. Uh, um, without this vision, uh, we can be every day working uh, close to the workers, but if they don't see us, even if we are at the other side of the world trying to negotiate 
a collective bargaining agreement, trying to negotiate the shifts for the day or the payment to be done uh, in due time, that if we are at the other side of the world and they cannot see us, uh, it's going to have a negative repercussion. Even if the benefits are there, that it's, uh, but we need the, uh, the understanding from the workers that we are doing something and that we need them to be strong because without their workers being affiliated to the unions, we won't be able to deliver and to, um, to counter back the pressure from um, employers association, from right-wing politicians, from a neoliberal environment which clearly is not working in our favor. Uh, Esther uh, talked uh, about the weakened working class uh, needs to be addressed and ended. Those, these working poor have to come to an end. Even if we are doing our best, uh, new forms of employment are coming up and uh, um, watering down all our efforts. So we need to keep evolving and uh, adapting to the new uh, environments uh, that we have. This has been, I think, also very clear all around the session today. And uh, we have to um, organize better and um, have uh, collective actions becoming paramount and useful for everyone. Uh, no, no more statements. Big statements are very nice. And from time to time, we need to do big statements. No doubt about it. But coordination, unions, and collective action has to be there all the way uh, to be helpful. Um, so um, thank you for uh, having, uh, per for permitting me having uh, these last words. Uh, now it's just two minutes before the end of the meeting. Um, thank you very much to all uh, the speakers, to the attendees to this uh, meeting. Thank you to the interpreters. Thank you very, very much to the interpreters. They are always uh, beautiful helping us uh, uh, in this difficult world uh, where we speak so many languages and we master none. Well, maybe uh, our own mother tongue. So thanks uh, to the interpreters again. And thank you also to the technical staff uh, behind the, the scene uh, making possible these kind of meetings, these kind of gatherings. Thank you, especially to Daniele and others that has been around and uh, I don't want to uh, forget anyone. So please uh, thank, uh, makes this uh, thank you extensive to all of you. Um, hope to see you soon. Uh, hope to see you in person rather than uh, via one of these uh, apps and uh, keep safe. Thank you very much everybody.